Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with chapter 9. Chapter 9 is natural convection. The chapter consists out of the physical mechanisms of natural convection, the equation of motion and the graph of number, natural convection over surfaces, natural convection from fin surfaces and printed circuit boards, and then natural convection inside enclosures and then the last part is natural and forced convection okay so let's start chapter nine natural convection the gentleman there at the back could you close that door for me please i will appreciate that okay before we start with chapter nine let's just go back to chapters seven and eight Chapters 7 and 8 were about forced convection. Forced convection. Okay. Now during forced convec convection, the fluid was always forced to flow over a surface. And normally, to make that possible, we will have a fan, a pump, a compressor, or a turbine. Those are typically the me mechanical elements that would force flow for us over a surface. And, very importantly, the missile number was always a function of the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number. And unfortunately, there's not one equation that we can always use. Okay. This function depends on the geometry, <coughs> the surface that we consider, and it also depends on the flow regime. So we know the flow can be laminar, can be the transitional flow regime, or it can be turbulent flow. And in each one of them, the flow might be developing or it might be fully developed. Okay. Developing or fully developed. The same for transition flow, it can be developing or it can be fully developed. Fortunately, in turbulent flow, the flow develops very quickly within 10 diameters then it is fully developed okay. and then also in the laminar and transitional flow regime it is also going to depend on the surface if the surface is kept at a constant temperature is there a constant heat flux or it might be not one of the two but a combination of the two. And the Nusselt number, as we've seen, because it's a function of the Reynolds and the Prandtl number, and the Reynolds number is equal to rho multiplied by the velocity divided by the kinematic uh, the Reynolds number is equal to the density multiplied by the velocity multiplied by the diameter divided by the kinematic viscosity. Normally the Nusselt number is therefore a strong function of velocity. It's a strong function of velocity. So the higher the velocity over the surface, the more heat transfer there will be. <coughs> okay. Now let's go to natural convection. Natural convection, typical velocities are smaller than one meters per second. It's very rarely that we will find in natural convection velocities larger than one meters per second. Typically less than one meters per second. And there is no <coughs> external source. And what we mean with an external source is 
the snow pump, the snow fan, no compressor, no turbine. The flow is being influenced or caused by buoyancy forces. Buoyancy. And we are going to see that the missile number is a function not only not of the Reynolds and the Prandtl number, but is now going to be a function of the Prandtl number and the Grashof number. The Grashof number. <coughs> and these two together are called the rally number. The rally number. Okay. So the Nusselt number for natural convection is a function of the rally number. <coughs> Forced convection, it is the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number. In natural convection, it's the rally number. But we have to remember inside the rally number is the Prandtl number. Okay. And then there is a last type of problem, which is a combination of forced convection and natural convection. <coughs> if you've got a natural convection situation and you have a, a fan delivering a very, very small velocity, then you can also have combinations of forced convection and natural convection, which is called mixed convection. We will get to that a little bit later. Okay, paragraph 9.1. is the physical mechanism. Phys physical mechanism of natural convection. Let's consider a hot egg. Hot egg on a surface <coughs> and we know that the ambient air is cold relatively to the hot egg. Okay, so what is now happening here on the surface is there is conduction from the hot surface to the air. This temperature of the air increases. The ideal gas law says that if the temperature increases, the density decreases. Okay. So the density decreases and the result is a flow pattern that looks something like that. Okay. <coughs> this cold air, because it is being heated, the density decreases and the result is a natural convection in an upward direction. Another example is a can of cold drink. Let's suppose it is cold and it's a warm day. It's a warm day. The cold can will decrease the temperature of the air next to it. If the temperature decreases, the density increases. So the result is flow in this direction. And we have natural convection around the cold can. So people always say hot air rises. It's not really absolutely correct. What we have is the density changes. And because of the density changes, the air will move up and it will display some of the colder air coming down. That is the natural way how natural, how natural convection starts. Now let's suppose 
gravity is equal to zero, there's no gravity, can natural convection then occurs? The answer is no. Okay. If G is equal to zero, then the Nusselt number would be equal to one. What does it mean if the Nusselt number is equal to one? It means that the heat transfer will be by conduction only. Just going back to your physics, remember the buoyancy force. equal to the density of the fluid multiplied by G multiplied by the volume of the body. Okay. What are examples that we see every day where there's natural convection heat transfer? What are examples? Except now those two examples. Hmm? Okay, in many cases the cooling of electronic components. In many cases your cell phones are being cooled by natural convection. TVs, DVDs, steam radiators, in some of the buildings you get these radiators next to walls which the, and through, through it they pump some hot water, you don't see it a lot these days anymore, steam radiators, okay what else, refrigerators, most of your houses there are refrigerators and at the back the condenser is not being cooled by a fan usually it is just natural convection that occurs there what other examples can you think of these lights I mean the lights <coughs> are being cooled by natural convection. Okay. All of you sitting here, there's natural convection around you. Okay. If the air conditioning system works, then cold air would be pumped into <coughs> this lecture venue. Its density is lower than that of the hot air, so it would come down. You are at a temperature of about 37 degrees Celsius, heat transfer to the ambient and then the hot air would rise again and it would be circulated through the evaporator coil and being cooled there. Okay, just going back to the buoyancy forces and Archimedes law, let's suppose you've got a ship in water ship in water and that would be the weight of the ship and that would be the buoyancy force and the net force would be equal to W minus the buoyancy force <coughs> Okay, the weight would be equal to M multiplied by G. Okay. The mass would be equal to the density multiplied by the volume of the body <coughs> multiplied by G. So that we can write the net force as the density multiplied by the volume of the body 
multiplied by G minus the density of Archimedes says the buoyancy force, force is equal to the density of the fluid multiplied by the density multiplied by the volume of the body. Oh, sorry. So you also Okay, so that we can write this as the density of the body minus the density of the fluid multiplied by G multiplied by the body, the volume of the body. So what does this tell us? It tells us that the force depends on the difference in the densities of the body and the fluid. A natural convection is the same principle. There are a few steps in the textbook that I'm going to skip that you can work through. But what this is going to is the fact that a volume expansion coefficient beta is being defined. A volume expansion coefficient. <coughs> The volume expansion coefficient beta and where beta is equal to 1 divided by the specific volume multiplied by partial dv dt at the constant pressure is equal to minus 1 divided by the density multiplied by partial d rho dt at the constant pressure. Okay, and the units <coughs> of the volume expansion coefficient is 1 divided by Kelvin. <coughs> okay, again I'm going to skip a few steps. It's in the textbook, you can go and work through it. It's not complicated. But in this the assumption is made that if the fluid that is being considered is an ideal gas, then beta of an ideal gas is very simple. It is 1 divided by the temperature in Kelvin. For a gas, an ideal gas, beta, the expansion coefficient, is 1 divided by the temperature in Kelvin. A large beta, what does a large beta mean? A large beta means a large change in density. <coughs> With temperature. Okay. A large beta means there's a large change in density with temperature. Right. Paragraph 9.2 is the equation of motion the equation of motion and the gross of number. Okay. And it starts by considering a flat plate where that temperature is equal to Ts, the surface temperature, and the environment is at the temperature T infinite, rho infinite, the flow is being considered as laminar, and also we consider a Newtonian fluid.
If we now consider the flow around this vertical tube, it is at a temperature Ts, where this temperature is higher than that of the environment. <coughs> so in terms of our discussion now, we know that the flow is going to move up. Okay. So if we now plot the boundary layer at that point there, how is it going to look like? We know that the velocity on the wall is equal, going to be equal to zero. Okay. Then it is going to increase. But what is different now <coughs> than that of forced convection is that the velocity boundary layer is going to look like that. Okay. It's going to reach a maximum and after that it is going to decrease because it can't keep on up to infinity having, having a velocity the influences are local it is just next, next to the wall only so the boundary layer of the velocities looks something like that the temperature distribution is different remember temperature is not a vector so let's <coughs> plot it as that distance equal to Ts, the temperature Ts, and then this would decrease up to the temperature T infinite. So that is T infinite, that is equal to Ts, and the temperature distribution would look like something like that. And what we do with our coordinate system is a little bit different than usual. That is our y-axis and that is our x-axis next to the wall. And what we do is we are going to consider a small volume inside the boundary layer. So if we consider this small volume of a distance dx in that direction and a distance dy in that direction, then we know it must have a certain weight, which is easy to get. It is the density multiplied by the volume. And if that is equal to the pressure P, then that is equal to P plus the P dx multiplied by dx, the distance dx. And if this is the shear stress tau, then that is equal to tau plus d tau <coughs> dy multiplied by the distance dy. So the force in the x direction, according to Newton's law, is equal to the mass multiplied by the acceleration, the mass of the volume multiplied by the acceleration, the mass is equal to the density multiplied by dx, multiplied by dy, multiplied by dz, and dz is equal to 1. So we consider it as a one-dimensional problem in the z-direction, a depth of one meter. And this acceleration, we've done acceleration in the first lecture of this course. I'm not going to write everything out, but it can be written as u multiplied by partial du dx plus V multiplied by partial du dy. Okay. okay, so that is according to Newton's second law. 
And what we're now going to do is we're going to look at the force in the y direction. And then we can write it as rho multiplied by du d u multiplied by partial du dx plus v multiplied by partial du dy is equal to the viscosity multiplied by partial d2u dy square minus partial dp dx minus rho g. Okay, I've, step, I've skipped a few steps, but all it is is a force, get all the forces to balance, okay? Get all the forces to balance, use this acceleration term, and then after a little bit of manipulation we can get to that term. Okay, and again, a little bit of manipulation, and then we can get the so-called momentum or buoyancy equation, which looks like this. U multiplied by partial du dx plus V multiplied by partial du dy is equal to the kinematic viscosity multiplied by partial d2u dy squared plus G multiplied by beta multiplied t by t minus t infinite. And let's call that equation 1 because we are going to use it a little bit later. Okay. So this is called the momentum equation, the buoyancy momentum equation. And what we can see is this term starting to, to develop here. Okay, now together with that equation, obviously we have the continuity equation. That we can also go and consider for this case, which would be equal to partial du dx plus partial dv dy is equal to zero. And the energy equation, which is equal to u multiplied by partial dt dx plus V partial dt dy is equal to alpha multiplied by partial d2 t dy squared. Okay, so we've got three equations that needs to be solved. <coughs> Unfortunately, it is not so easy to get an analytical equation for it can solve it numerically. In terms of the boundary conditions, at y equals zero, okay, at y equals zero at this point here, on the boundary, on the, on the flat plate, u is equal to v is equal to zero, and the temperature would be equal to the surface temperature. Temperature would be equal to the surface temperature. And where y is equal to infinity, that is far away from the plate, when y is equal to infinity, it is out of the boundary layer, then again, the velocity is zero, the u direction as well as in the v direction and the temperature would now be equal to t infinite. Okay. To solve these three equations we can define a similarity variable that will help us to change the three partial differential equations into two partial differential equations. The detail in mathematics is not in your textbook, but it is available in the literature. Now together with that, all this results is non-dimensionalized. It's non-dimensionalized, where x star is equal to x divided by LC, and LC 
is the length of the plate. LC is the length of the plate. And U star is equal to U divided by capital V. Okay. Now normally we would say capital V, capital V would be the velocity of the free stream. Okay, which in this case is zero. So we cannot choose that to non-dimensionalize our equation. So that V is a reference velocity, an arbitrary reference velocity. An arbitrary reference velocity. And you can go and choose it wherever you want. Maybe you would like to choose this, abs this maximum velocity here. <coughs> if you want to. Okay, and together with that is the non-dimensionalized temperature is then defined as T minus T infinite divided by T S minus T infinite. Okay, and all this can now be substituted into equation one. Into equation one. And it can be made a little bit neat. And it's got lots of terms on the left hand side. That is not so important now. But what is important is the term just after the equal sign. This term looks like this. It is G multiplied by beta multiplied by T minus T infinite multiplied by LC to the third divided by the kinematic viscosity square. multiplied by the reference temperature divided by the Reynolds number squared plus some other terms also. But this is the specific term we are interested in. And this term is the Grassoff number. The Grassoff number, L to indicate, it is based on the length of the plate. We've chosen that as our non-dimensionalized non characteristic length. So the graph of number is equal to G multiplied by B multiplied by the surface temperature minus T infinite LC to the third <coughs> divided by the kinematic viscosity. Sorry, that temperature there is the surface temperature. The temperature there is the surface temperature. Okay, so this is the graph of number. Graph of number. The graph of number actually tells us something. If we go and look at it in detail, it gives us the ratio of the buoyancy forces. ratio of the buoyancy forces to the viscous forces. <clears throat> okay, now in general we can make a few observations. The first one is that in forced convection FC is forced convection. I just don't want to write it out every time now. And NC is going to be natural convection. So in forced convection, the Nusselt number is dominated by the Reynolds number. Okay. And, is, and it is the Reynolds number that would tell us if the flow is laminar or turbulent. In forced convection, the Nusselt number is dominated by the Reynolds number and the Reynolds number would be a good indication of, or the parameter that we use to determine if the flow is 
laminar or turbulent. Okay. In natural convection, in natural convection, the Nusselt number is dominated by the Grassoff number. And now it is the Grassoff number that tells us if the flow is laminar or turbulent. And for a vertical plate, for a vertical plate, that would be a Grassoff number of approximately 10 to the ninth. If the Grassoff number is smaller than 10 to the ninth, the flow would be laminar. If it is larger than 10 to the ninth, it would be turbulent. <coughs> Now, it is possible, or there are cases where, for this same flat plate, if we have this flat plate, which is being heated, and now we know there is natural convection over the flat plate. If I would go and put a fan there, a slow, very slow moving fan and I start increasing, rotating it very, very, very slowly. So forcing a little bit of flow over that flat plate. Okay. Then we've got mixed convection. So this gives us mixed convection. If I keep on increasing this velocity, I would get to a point where the natural convection is negligible and it's only a forced convection problem. Okay. So, when do we know if it is a forced convection problem or a natural convection problem? A very important parameter that tells us the, that is the ratio of the Grassoff number divided by the Reynolds number squared. That ratio would tell us if the flow is the problem, is a forced convection problem, or if it is a natural convection problem. So, therefore, there are three possibilities. The first one is if the Grassoff number divided by the Reynolds number square is much larger than one. then the inertial forces are negligible and it would be a natural convection problem. Okay, the second case would be if the Grassoff number divided by the Reynolds number square is much smaller than one, then the forced convection would dominate which means the buoyancy forces are negligible. And then the third case would be when the Grassoff number divided by the Reynolds number square is in the order of approximately one. Then we've got forced convection plus natural convection and we call that mixed convection. mixed convection. Just as an example, let's suppose we look at these three different cases. We've got a hot cylinder hanging from the roof. The cylinder is hot. And we have natural convection around the cylinder. So it is a natural convection problem. For this category of problem, 
the Grassoff number divided by the Reynolds number square is much larger than 1. Okay, the second category is the same hot cylinder. But now we've got a fan that forces, that forces the flow over this hot cylinder. So the flow will do something like that. Depending on the Reynolds number, might have a recirculation areas at the back and vortices, etc. Detail is not so important now. But that is a forced convection problem. The third category of problem is now I start making the fan speed slower and slower and slower. And the result would be now that if we look at the flow around this cylinder or the sphere, something like that happens. So we've got forced convection plus natural convection, which is mixed convection. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in terms of the theory, any questions? If not, thank you very much.